Hello, this is Mr. Coates, and this is the lecture on ecology and populations. Uh, ecology is actually one of my uh, most favorite aspects of biology. It, it, to me, it kind of wraps up all the geology, all the atmospheric science, uh, all the water science, and kind of relates it to biology. And so I really like that. So ecology would be like the study of basically the environment, so all of the living things, which are the trees and the animals, along with the abiotic, which would be the atmosphere here, the uh, how high the altitude affects the uh, plant life in this in the mountains here, the how much water falls in this desert region. That is all about that is all ecology there. All right, so the basics. Ecology comes from uh, the Greek word. Uh, Icos, which means house. So it's the study of your house. In this case, of course, our house is the earth, the study of ecology. So it's, like I said, it's a study of the abiotic factors, abiotic, and the biotic factors, which are the living ones, and how they interact together. So this is the uh, Everglades here, and uh, Everglades is a very complex ecological system in itself. Uh, we have uh, fresh water and salt water in intermingling. We have all kinds of plants. We have saltwater plants, freshwater plants. We've got plants that can handle both. We've got animals that can handle both. Um, we also have different weather patterns. We can have tropical storms. Uh, we can have uh, dry conditions sometimes. Sometimes we can have fires in the Everglades. So there are all kinds of abiotic factors that affect all these living things and the tides that go back and forth. Uh, through these inlets and outlets, um, and, and then and the interaction of all the animals, the wading birds and the alligators and the fish and so forth. And so looking at all that as one big picture is the study of ecology. All right, now when we talk about ecology, there are levels of organization, and I want to thank Paul Anderson for this lovely acronym up here, uh, BEBECPO. So the biosphere is the largest unit or organization and it encompasses these four smaller spheres here. So we have the atmosphere, uh, which is all the air and the winds that move around. We have the ecosphere, which is all the living organisms on the surface of the planet. We have the lithosphere, which is all of the solid part of the crust or the, uh, the surface of the planet, the dirt and so forth and the rock. And then of course the biggest part is the hydrosphere which is all of the water on the planet. So that's the largest level of organization uh, in ecology. The next level of organization is a biome. A biome is a large area on uh, the surface of the planet that has a very similar uh, climate, a very similar plant community. And so very large areas of the similar ecosystem on the planet. So in this part of the United States where we live here is all the uh, biome of deciduous forest biome here. And you see some of that same biome over here in Europe and parts of Asia and so forth. Other biomes obviously include the desert ones. Uh, we have some of that in the United States as well. Uh, you got mountain biomes, which are in the blue, and of course the rainforest down in Brazil. So those are biomes. The next level is the ecosystem. So if we look at uh, small parts of a biome, we can look at individual ecosystems. So here we have a mountain ecosystem. We have the flowers down here and the larger pine trees. And you get further up, you get more of a tundra ecosystem here. But this would be more of a coniferous forest ecosystem. And, uh, and so that's our next level of uh, ecological study. All right, the next level of organization is the community. The community includes the small areas of all the organisms within that ecosystem. So we're talking just the flowers, we're talking just the trees, all the animals, the little mice, uh, bears, the birds, and so forth. Every animal that is in this area, this ecosystem is a community. So you have several different species in a community. The next level is population. Now when we talk about ecology, we're going to be studying populations most of the time. So a population is basically all of the organisms of the same species in the same area. So in that mountain ecosystem, you could have a stand of uh, aspen trees. And that aspen tree stand is one uh, population. The last level of organization, and also the smallest, is uh, the individual animal. So within that uh, aspen forest, you could have uh, a single wolf or a pack of wolves, obviously. Uh, but the individual organism is the, sing is the smallest level of organization. 
Now, when you talk about organisms in an ecosystem, each organism in the ecosystem has its own role. Okay, the role and also the area, the conditions you find that animal in are called its niche. Okay, and niches can be if you're a mushroom, your niche would be a decomposer. Your role is to decompose things, and you live on a log. Uh, you need so much water. Uh, if uh, you're a bear, your niche is an omnivore. Uh, you eat berries, bugs, uh, small rodents, uh, maybe a large leftover kill from a wolf pack or something like that. And uh, so where you live, the conditions you live in, what, you're, what you do in the ecosystem is your niche. Now when we talk about niches ecologically, there are two specific types we want to look at. First is a generalist type niche. Generalist type niche is a niche that is very broad. You're, you can survive a lot of different characteristics in the environment. Uh, you can eat several different things. Uh, you can handle a wide varying of conditions. And so that's a very broad generalist type species. A good example is a raccoon. A raccoon is a very good general species. And then you have specialist species. Specialist species, unfortunately, are very narrow in what they eat or where they live, the conditions they can handle. And uh, which, which is unfortunate for a lot of these species because this makes them easy for extinction. Well, a good example is the panda. The panda here only eats bamboo. The panda is very specific on reproduction and, and uh, other aspects of his life. So it has a very narrow niche. If we look at the breadth of its niche down here, it's very narrow compared to something that's more general like the breadth of uh, the, the raccoon here. Another more common uh, general species we find around here quite a lot is your ever favorite cockroach. Cockroaches are excellent at surviving just about any type of conditions. They adapt quickly, they eat almost anything, they don't need to eat a lot of food. So that's a good example of a general species as well. All right. When we have those organisms in an ecosystem, they all interact with each other. And some of these interactions are good, some of them are bad, some of them are very close. Some of those very close interactions we call symbiosis. All right, so symbiosis is where you have two or more organisms that interact with each other in certain ways and they have a close interaction all the time. So one of the uh, main types of symbiosis is, is this one right here. This is mutualism. The classic example of mutualism is when two organisms help each other. Uh, so the clownfish and the anemone are very good. The clownfish gets protection because the anemone has stinging cells and every once in a while the clownfish will dart out and grab food items and put it into the anemone tentacles for the anemone. So both organisms help out each other in their survivorship here. The next one is down here. This one is parasitism. In parasitism one of the organisms is harmed. So in this case this fish is being preyed upon or fed upon by these lamprey. A lamprey is a jawless fish and it bores a hole into the, uh, the actual fish and sucks out its body, body fluids. Eventually the lamprey will fall off but the fish will be left with uh, damaging wounds and may not survive. The, the last type down here is commensalism. And commensalism is where uh, you have one organism that's benefited. In this case this bromeliad right here, this plant right here, is being benefited because it's getting a place to grow. Uh, but it's not harming the tree. The tree is not getting any benefit from the bromeliad, but it's not being harmed either. Br the bromeliad is not a parasite on the tree. The bromeliad just grows on the side of the tree and it gets its nutrients from the atmosphere that fall into its leaves here. All right, one of the other close uh, relationships between organisms is competition. If uh, you have two organisms whose niche is very close together, then you can have what we call competition. Technically, no two organisms should have the same niche. However, sometimes the niches overlap, like in this graph right here, the little niches overlap. So species one and species two have this region of competition here. And so they will fight for whatever resource where they overlap. Uh, it may be food items, it may be water, it might be a, a, a space requirement for their uh, homes or their shelters whatever it is, but uh, they're comp competing for it because their niches overlap in this region. Now as time goes on, these two uh, will stop competing for the same thing because they'll both gain different adaptations to either uh, outcompete the other one or to live, learn to live with the other one. And eventually, over time, due to evolution and adaptation, basically we get 
the separation of these niches. And so we get more specialized organisms at that point. So another way to avoid competition is what we call resource partitioning. And what this means is that they divide the resource up into different parts so they can use it. And so the wading birds that we find here in Florida are a good example. So we have birds that can go fairly shallow and we have egrets and herons that can go deeper. We have diving birds like this and so forth. But they all kind of fish and uh, get food in the same general area, but they all have different adaptations. They might have very long beaks, they might have beaks that can crack open shells, uh, they might have pouches to catch fish, they might have very long necks, they might be able to dive. And so all these birds can use the same area and go after similar resources, maybe not the same resource, but in different ways. Some may even hunt at night versus during the day. So they're splitting up this whole resource of the beach area here into different parts, and this is called resource partitioning. Warblers are also a good example of how this works. There are several different species of warbler out there, these little birds with the yellow on them. And some warblers will only use the outside of the tree, some will use the middle and inside of the tree, some will use the top, some will use the bottom. And so by partitioning out this resource, they don't compete for whatever they need out of this tree. And that's called resource partitioning. Predator-prey relationship also happens out. A lot of the organisms that live out in the ecosystem are predators. They hunt prey to, eat, to get their energy, so they eat other animals. So sharks are good examples, bears, tigers, and so forth. Good examples of those predators. And so what you get is this predator-prey relationship over time. And as we look at a population and how it changes, our prey population will, if there's no predators on them, no pressure to eat them, then our prey population spikes up very high here. Uh, once the predators start feeding on them, the predators will start reproducing because they have more resource from the prey. And so their numbers will also climb. Eventually, there's too many predators and the prey crashes. There's not enough prey, and then shortly after, the predator crashes. So you get this predator-prey back and forth here, and you really see that in the wild. If we look down at this graph here, this is actual real data that occurred on Isle Royal, which is an island up in uh, Michigan, where they have moose and they re reintroduce wolves. And so uh, the moose population was pretty high at one time, and then they introduced the wolves, and the wolves started coming in, and, and obviously there's not as many wolves as moose, but uh, they, uh, as the moose population was high, the wolf population climbed and got pretty big here. But as that happened, then the moose population dropped again. And after the moose population dropped, then the wolf population dropped, and then the moose population re-increased. So what you'll see is this back and forth between the predators and the prey. And this is a predator-prey relationship. Very common, well-known phenomenon that happens out there with all predator-prey relationships. Now when we talk about different species, there are different species types in the ecosystem. And each species type uh, is based on what its role is or where it came from. One of the first ones we want to look at is a keystone species. A keystone species is a species that's very important to the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, for example, the sea otter here. The sea otter is very uh, important to the kelp forest. And the sea otter eats sea urchins and clams and other uh, types of shellfish that would eat the kelp. And uh, sometimes when the sea otters are overhunted, for fur, then the uh, populations of those kelp eating organisms skyrocket and therefore they eat all the kelp and then the kelp forest goes away and you totally change the ecosystem just by removing one organism out of the ecosystem. Now the American alligator is another type of species. It's, it's not only a keystone species, it's also called a foundation species. And a foundation species is also very important to its ecosystem but it also manipulates the ecosystem. Alligators are very good at digging gator holes in the swamps. They clear out areas of uh, vegetation. They pile up areas of vegetation for their nests. So they physically change the ecosystem and provide other habitats for other organisms. So their high mounds will provide drier habitat for wading birds to hunt uh, other uh, organisms in the shallow water. Also, a abandoned gator mound will serve as a nesting site for some birds. And then their pools open up and allow fish to populate those pools. So gator is a foundation species. Another good example of a foundation species are corals. Corals build and construct the actual reef 
and so they actually change the habitat as they grow and you could also consider corals as keystone species as well. Now indicator species are a little bit different. They may or may not be a keystone species but an indicator species is special because they indicate ecosystem damage. Amphibians are really good at uh, indicating ecosystem damage because they absorb things very easily through their skin. So if you notice amphibian populations decreasing rapidly, that means there's some kind of damage going on in the ecosystem itself. Birds are also another good indication of ecosystem damage. Birds are very sensitive to air pollution and other things, other pollutants, and uh, the decrease in songbirds it can be a sure sign that there's some kind of ecological problem. This is why miners used to use canaries in uh, the mines because the canaries would be affected first by the buildup of gases and the miners would have a chance to get out beforehand. Endemic species. Endemic species are those species that are naturally found in that area and have been there for ages. An endemic species is uh, like a gopher tortoise here in Florida in the sandhill scrub areas. Uh, and uh, so there's lots of endemic species out there. Unfortunately, we tend to move species around, and so endemic species become fewer and fewer as time goes on. But uh, endemic species usually stay in a small area. They have a small, narrow range, uh, and uh, they are what we call the true native species. We also have exotic species. Now, exotic species makes them sound bad, but they're not necessarily all bad. In fact, most of our fruits and vegetables and our farm animals are actually exotic species that weren't naturally here in the United States when settlers first started moving over here. So exotic species is basically a species that's been brought from somewhere else and it has been put to use for us in some, uh, some form, usually in our gardens. In fact, most of the plants you buy are exotic species. Uh, they haven't been, they aren't found in nature here, in, naturally here. They're not endemic to Florida. They don't necessarily become bad though. Now let's say one does come bad, then we start calling those invasive species. A good example is lionfish here. In the last uh, 10 years, lionfish has exploded off the coast of Florida, both the Atlantic and the Gulf now. And uh, lionfish is actually from the Pacific Ocean and doesn't belong in the Atlantic, but uh, somehow they got released from aquariums. They are very popular aquarium fish and they got released in the Atlantic. And now they're eating all the reef fish and creating quite, quite an ecological imbalance throughout the state of Florida in our uh, reefs. We can actually find these now off of Tampa Bay uh, when people are diving and so this has become a huge problem. Other invasive species can be plants like kudzu, Brazilian pepper, melaleuca tree, uh, those are all very common in this area. Uh, in fact, Florida it has the second most invasive species of any state next to Hawaii. So we have our share of invasive species here in Florida. Now as I said before, alligators can be both. Sometimes you can have species being two of these. So uh, alligator is both a keystone and a foundation species uh, because not only does it change its habitat like a foundation, but if it goes away, its habitat totally changes. Well, I hope that was helpful in learning a little bit about the basics of ecology and some of the species types that you're going to need to know about in apes.